great. We've got pages of uh, people joining and I'm sure we'll have more people coming in. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks uh, to everyone for joining us. Uh, this is the second um, TCT, Tin Can Tutoring. We wanted to kind of keep the letters the same uh, session. So we this year we decided to keep our community engaged in one of the ways everyone is doing that is through virtual sessions. Um, Steve and I were joking around that uh, we used Tim Heinz uh, for our first session because he's, um, he's, he's a social media influencer compared to Steve and I, and uh, probably as well known as anyone in the vintage trailer uh, community. But uh, Steve is a close second, you may be tied. So uh, we figured we'd go and talk with Steve in this session. Um, here, let me, uh, let me make sure I can advance slides here and move on. Uh, so if you can stay on mute so we don't have the audio coll uh, collisions and confusion. Um, this is our second uh, virtual event. Um, so we're, I'm still learning how to run these efficiently and effectively. So um, forgive me if I make mistakes and if you come off mute and I'll forgive you if we have to kind of stop and un unmute things and get uh, get the train back on the tracks. Uh, we are recording this event and I'll make it available just like I did the first one on our website. So if there is anything interesting that you wanna share with your friends later on, you'll be able to um, share that video with them or if there's something that you missed and you want to go back and take a look at you'll be able to do that and um, we are very grateful that you've decided to spend uh, your Saturday afternoon with us but what else do we have to do right um, well Steve's got a whole business to run but um, a little information about uh, the club I know there this event was shared uh, Steve shared it on his social media pages and his um, and I know it was shared in a number of other clubs like the Airstream Club. Um, so not everyone might be a member of the Tin Can Tourist that's on the call today. So just so you know, uh, Tin Can Tourist is the oldest uh, trailer club in the US. Uh, we turned 102 this year. In 2019, we had our centennial anniversary. Um, and the club started in 1919 and we've kind of changed our focus uh, since when it started to now we're an all make and model vintage trailer club. Um, I'm a little biased, uh, but I think we are not only the oldest, but the best vintage trailer club in the world. And we are a very diverse club. So it doesn't matter the age of your trailer, doesn't matter how big your trailer is or how small your trailer is, whether you pull it or whether you tow it or whether you pop it up as a tent, doesn't matter what shape it is. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's completely restored and uh, a museum piece. Matter of fact, I think most of the time, barn finds that come to our events are the most interesting trailers at our events, things that our people are just starting to work, at, work on. Everyone is welcome to join our club and come camping with us. Um, we do, we work hard to promote the interests of our community. Uh, so we do that with campgrounds to make sure that, you know, vintage trailers are accepted, uh, parts manufacturers. And this was even before I decided to have Steve join us for one of these sessions like Vintage Trailer Supply and different restoration companies and historians. And we want to make sure that the community is as supported um, and served appropriately as best we can. Uh, so a little bit about myself and Steve. Um, so I uh, became the head of the Tin Can Tourist uh, right after the centennial, uh, inherited that from my parents. So uh, myself and my wife, uh, Michelle, we own two trailers right now. We've had lots, but the two that we currently have uh, one is a 49 American Homecrest and the other that was made in Michigan and the other is a 
57 Avion that was also made in Michigan. Um, pr prior to um, taking on the leadership role with the club, we were very active running the mid-states, uh, being the regional mid-states and putting on events and working with my parents in the background. Uh, right now we live up north uh, in Michigan, up by Houghton Lake. Steve, you'll have to correct me, Steve, This some of this information might be old. Uh, I pulled it from some of the bios we used at, when you became a Hall of Fame member uh, to the Tin Can Tourist. So Steve's the owner of Vintage Trailer Supply. It is the premier vintage trailer lifestyles general store, serves thousands of customers every year. Uh, if anyone ever has a question, they either come to the Tin Can Tourist and ask us or they call up Vintage Trailer Supply and ask them about parts and how things work. Um, and Steve and his crew is, are very gracious in uh, answering any questions. Uh, Steve, so now tell me if this is still true, Steve, uh, the ownership of your trailers, uh, Airstream, Caravanner, and the Curtis Wright Model 2. Yeah, and I think a couple 49 Spartans also. Yeah, there you go. Uh, member of the Wally Byam Club, the Vintage Airstream Club, and uh, we inducted Steve as a Hall of Fame member for his support um, of our community um, a few years back. I think it was, a, was that just before the centennial, I think, a couple years before? Yeah. Uh, no, the Hall of Fame was, uh, yeah, that's right. It was, it was in fall of 19. Okay. Yeah. Um, when Tim and I did the first session, I said our views were very different. Um, where my view was uh, on the left and still looks a lot like this, uh, a lot of snow on the lake that's uh, behind our, our house, uh, Houghton Lake. And, but Steve and my view are very similar. Uh, so Steve sent me this picture uh, earlier today. Uh, this is uh, your place in Vermont, Steve? Yeah, it's where I'm. Uh, it's where I'm holding up for uh, for COVID. That's right. All right. All right. So I put together a list of questions, uh, kind of starter questions for Steve, um, around kind of the impacts of the pandemic and his company and how he's working through that. Uh, Steve sent me a, a PowerPoint that really kind of helps walk through a lot of the, the answers to these questions. So I'm going to switch over to that PowerPoint and then Steve can walk us through that. So just give me a second here. Stop this shit. Well, while Terry's doing that, I just wanna say hi. Um, I am really excited to see your faces, some of you. Um, so much of what we do all the time is remote and especially this past year has been so remote and it's it's been painful for so many of us to to be cut off from those social connections so thank you terry for I think you're at the end of the presentation there yeah i'll get back here there you go that's the beginning um so How's that the, yeah it's great you all can right. put it in presentation mode if that works there you go um The, uh, you know, our business is, um, we have about 10 of us who work at Vintage Trailer Supply, uh, mostly uh, in New Mexico, um, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, but we are scattered out a little bit, a few of us in Vermont, one in Utah, and uh, it's a uh, it's a very human business, as you know, but it feels it feels a little less than that this last year. So I'm I'm excited. And Terry, thank you so much for not just uh, doing this for all of us, but also um, for holding the the community together in so many ways over time, um, and for your and your families and the entire club's support of our small business for the last you know 15, 20 years. So thank you so much. Um, I want to, if you don't mind, I'm going to go through this quickly. I have just 10 slides and I don't want to uh, make this a lecture. 
So I think if folks have um, uh, things to inter interject, I can kind of keep an eye on chat, but I get nervous, so I don't always look at it. Um, but uh, if, if Terry, if you want to interrupt and throw in some questions for folks, that's great. And uh, you know, we can take this wherever we want. But I just sure. want to go through a few things. Steve, are you seeing the notes view? Or are you seeing the full? I'm seeing um, the aside, but I'm not seeing notes. I don't. Eh, I don't know what I'm seeing. I'm not seeing full. I don't think. Yeah, I think I was showing it. Kind of was sharing. It should the, be a uh, present. Yes. Hold on a second here. I'll get there. Try this. Better. There you go. That looks great. All right. Yep, and I'll uh, keep right. an eye on so, so my goal here was to just quickly go over a little bit about um, what we're seeing trends right now in the vintage trailer world, and also, um, and a little bit about how that's impacted our business, and uh, maybe have a, a bit of a discussion about all that. So we can go to the next slide. So I wanted to go over four basic areas, uh, talk a little bit about the social disruption uh, that we've been having as a community over the last uh, year now. Uh, and also the, the re go back one, if you don't mind, Terry. Um, and the restart that. with that, also go over uh, RV industry and how that's changing for the year. Go over the, uh, the kind of the impact on restorers. And I'm seeing quite a few of them joining in here, which is great and also some issues that are gonna affect all of us around camping infrastructure and what we're gonna see with the next year or two or three or five. So, uh, okay, now you can switch to the next one. We'll go over this first one. Go ahead and hit the button a couple of times. There you go, that's good. Um, so obviously 2020 was a hot mess uh, and uh, we saw in our community and Terry can speak to this better than anyone um, is that we kind of had to clear our calendars for 2020. It was a, whatever plans we thought we had really didn't play out. Uh, at first, we saw uh, job losses throughout the country and job losses in our own industry. Um, there was fear among many of us about uh, how deep this would go, whether this would be a repeat of the recession, the great recession, how many of us would lose our jobs, how many of us would be scaled back. Uh, it created a lot of confusion and frankly, paralysis throughout the country. And that I'm talking about the first quarter into the second quarter of the year. Um, it hit our industry and our, and our lifestyle and hobby uh, as much as it hit anyone in that first quarter or so. Um, and uh, uh, then we started to get into this summer of regulation, which uh, was uh, meant that a lot of the events that we had planned couldn't happen. Um, and uh, for some of us, that was uh, uh, uncomfortable and uh, objection, objectionable. Um, and for others, saw it as just fine. But it was definitely a monkey wrench for everyone. And uh, that is, we're still in that to some extent. But in some ways, we've transitioned into this next phase, which is that we are all in integrating this concept of, of living a different way of life around safety. Go ahead and go on to the next, go to click, thanks. Um, so when we, um, when we look towards the future now and we understand that we're, we're emerging from some of the regulation and some of the fear and chaos, but we still have this um, safety mindset, um, I think we've got quite a few things to look forward to here, uh, but I think life's gonna be different. First of all, I think that um, in 2020, we had a lot of limited events. Um, in fact, we canceled a lot of them and uh, those that were held had major restrictions on them. We're all eager to get back to a new normal, but the truth is that uh, many of those restrictions are likely to continue throughout 2021. And I guess my questions for all of us, um, and I, I may just leave it as an open question is, um, will it return? Will we ever get back to the way we were from a social perspective when it comes to vintage trailer events especially. Um, we know it's going to change in a lot of ways for our, for our businesses and our office places. Uh, but uh, one of the things that comes to mind is uh, the, the tradition of the Saturday open house. Um, you know, obviously we're not doing those now, but will we ever do them again? Will we be opening up our events to the general community and having people come through our trailers um, in the next year or two or three? Um, 
you know, my sense is that we will eventually. I just think that it's going to be one of those things that is slow to return, uh, perhaps slower than any of the other pieces will be uh, the, the idea of the, uh, you know, the hugs and the how many people are going to open our drawers and look at our, you know, look at our underwear in the drawers while they're touring our trailer. I think it's a very different world that we're going to be going back into when we start these events. Um, as a company, we, uh, we virtually stopped sponsoring events, stopped providing um, you know, door prizes and donations to events in 2020. We are having a debate among our own staff right now about how soon to be restarting and resupporting events in 2021. We're looking at putting in some guidelines on which events we're able to support based on um, some social distancing and uh, just having some good safe practices as folks restart their, restart their, uh, their social connections again. You can go ahead to the next. The RV industry changing dramatically. Um, we all know it was already pretty hot um, coming off the Great Recession. Things had moved up pretty quickly. Uh, 1919 was a good year. 2020 um, was an interesting year for the RV industry as a whole. Uh, the, the, it, despite having shut down, literally just shut down for a couple months, uh, it was one of the best years in history. And uh, they sold about, or they delivered about 400,000 RVs last in 2020, which was a pretty big number. Not the biggest, but one of the biggest. Um, the biggest was a few years ago, it was around 500,000. And uh, so what they're seeing for 2021 in projections is it's gonna get back up to those old numbers. It's highly likely they're gonna actually set a new record in 2021 with RV sales. It'll definitely match that, uh, that earlier one. So right around a half a million new RVs on the road in 2021. That's a very large number. Go ahead and hit, click the next. So obviously this is gonna have an impact on all of us. Um, many of us own new RVs or late model RVs, but probably the vast majority don't. And, but this does have a ripple effect into all of our lives. Uh, first of all, um, we're seeing in the vintage world, there is a shortage of trailers for sale um, as people are looking for trailers to buy. For, uh, specifically, people are looking for trailers that are ready to go or pretty close to ready to go. There hasn't been as much change in the industry in terms of um, uh, long-term product projects, but that is there also, and I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, right now, if you've got uh, an older trailer in good shape that could be camped in, um, it's, it's probably gone up quite a bit in value. In fact, even the, the, um, the project trailers have gone up a lot in value. We keep track of these sales informally. We connect to a lot of the folks who are buying and selling trailers professionally and restoring, and we're seeing the numbers going up. Certainly 50% is not a, a rule. Um, they go up, they've gone up anywhere from 10 or 15% up to double. Um, but there is a, the demand is outstripping the supply right now on all RVs and, uh, and in the vintage world, it's starting to be that way too. We're seeing a, a focus uh, more on the larger trailers uh, that can be self-contained, uh, things that might be able to accommodate a family rather than just retirees, couples. Uh, so what we're seeing now is more movement into younger families and uh, larger trailers. So, uh, you know, you can see this, many of us own very small trailers because we understand how practical they are for recreation, but the uses go beyond recreation now, um, both family escape, work from the road, but in many other ways, uh, they're being used in as, you know, as many ways as we can think of. So we're seeing uh, pressure, especially on the, you know, the 25 foot units, that kind of range is quite a bit. Um, so that's kind of how the two fit together. The growth of the RV industry is pushing on ours also. Let's go to the next one. Go ahead and click there. Yep, thanks. So uh, I wanted to spend a moment just pointing to our own vintage trailer restorer community. Uh, this is something that's developed over the last decade or so is a much more robust and professional community of of uh, our neighbors and our community members who are, who are making a living or trying to doing uh, vintage trailer restoration. And it's um, 2020 was a tale of two years for them. Uh, the first half of the year was scary. 
Um, many of us don't have a lot of cash reserves. Many of us are living virtually paycheck to paycheck. And uh, when we saw the stop work going on um, in the spring, uh, that affected many shops had to shut down, especially if they were bigger than a one or two person shop. They were needing to follow the local uh, emergency orders and just put a hold on things. Thankfully, um, some of us came together. Uh, I saw Greg Penners online, I think. Greg uh, gave me a call and they, Julie and Greg said, you know, let's, oh, I think Julie's there too, said, let's, uh, let's see if maybe we can convene some of the pros whose lifeblood, like, you know, is uh, built on these things and who needs the, who this is going to be a financial problem for. Let's get together. So with Terry and a lot of you who are on the line here, we got together and uh, we had a little Zoom meeting to talk about some of the federal financial assistance that might be available for those who could not uh, work, who needed to pay their employees, but there just wasn't uh, any way to have revenue at the time. So I was really uh, uh, heartened, but I was uh, just inspired by the way that the community came together in the professional industrial industry side of this to, um, to really try to hold each other's hands a little bit and, and try to offer assistance. It was, it was a beautiful thing. Uh, for a lot of folks, that um, financial difficulty was crippling to the point where they had to change their business. Um, but if they were able to emerge or, uh, or restructure in some way, many folks have found that then in the second half of 2020, uh, demand started to pick up. And by the end of the year, um, bookings had resumed for restoration work. And in fact, by the end of 2020, I was hearing some really positive stories about um, uh, bookings now, you can go ahead and go on to the next, or click one more time, please. Sure. Um, you can see now that many of the bookings, folks are booking into 2022 now, meaning that uh, work, uh, that they've got work booked far, far ahead. Um, and they're putting people in a queue saying, we'll get to you as soon as we can. But there's still the same stressors. Uh, this isn't a lucrative business for almost anyone. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult business and folks are still feeling out how to make this work. Um, labor shortages, uh, as folks need to scale up to be able to meet the demand, become a, a disruptive and um, create chaos in the business. Um, parts availability has been tough with, through us and through others uh, and just the general lack of, uh, of uh, reproduction parts or ease to get to some of the hard to get stuff. So. That is a big piece. And then finally, professionalism. And this is something that um, Terry and I and others have talked about for a decade, which is that as the industry grows, um, we're, we're needing to, to focus on professionalism in the industry regarding uh, customer client expectations, billing, profit margins, um, uh, estimating uh, quality of work, uh, those sorts of things are all still a struggle for this rather new industry. And uh, those are things that we're going to see um, what additional pressures on as demand increases in 2021. So the, the industry is by no means in trouble, um, but it did have a rough first half of the year. And uh, I think that it created enough scar tissue that I think it's going to take a little while to get through that and get some of our friends who are in the restoration business uh, back on track the way they'd like to be and move to, you know, the next development in their businesses. Let's go on to the next one. This is sort of the last piece of this, which is um, uh, camping infrastructure. As we see tens of thousands of new people coming into the vintage trailer world and the RV world, um, we have already got a problem with campground shortages, places to stay. And um, this is going to become severe ahead. We, had, we have pent up demand um, with uh, uh, folks who didn't go on vacation in 2020. Uh, they stayed home. I, heard, I had one friend who said, why would I burn up my, my precious earned uh, uh, vacation time at work to not be able to do what I really want to do? I'm just saving it. And I, we're seeing that where people can do that if they have. Um, and so we're going to see people really hit the road in 2021, um, both new RVers and folks who cannot travel internationally or want to travel domestically now. Go ahead and click the next one, please. 
So this 2021 is a plan ahead year. Um, if you are not booking your trips now for summer, fall, and into spring next year, it's time to get on it. Um, we're seeing campgrounds have many popular campgrounds have always booked 12 months in advance, but now we're seeing that becoming more of the rule than the exception, uh, especially in public campgrounds, national park areas, popular state parks. Uh, the, the demand for places to sleep is growing and this is going to be, uh, we're actually hearing stories of the prices, the resale prices on campgrounds where people are selling their family campgrounds. I have heard stories of them doubling in value this year, um, campground sales. Uh, I don't know if that's a, uh, if it's, it's more scare than anything, but it is definitely out there that the price of campgrounds, because they're hard to permit, they're hard to uh, build new, um, existing campgrounds do have value uh, and increasingly so. So uh, all of us need to be looking to alternative camping like places using sources like Campendium um, as we move through this and going off the beaten path. And I think that might be one of the, the cool things about this for those of us who have been campers for a while is it's just going to get us to get out there and find some BLM land. And uh, But of course, that'll change the way we use our travel trailers too. Let's go to the next. So I wanted to finish my little piece with, don't click anymore. This is kind of my, my timeline. Um, okay. I want to finish this piece with a little bit about where we're at as a company. Um, we are a, a, an important part of the community. We're, uh, because we've put ourselves as a necessary part of the community. And that means we have a responsibility. And 2020 has been tough. And I want to go over that a little bit to let you know kind of where we're at and what we see for the future. So if you can click one time, please, Terry. So back in 2000, I founded this company in my bedroom. It's a company called Airstream Dreams. And I don't think any of you were born yet, but it was a, it was a very, uh, it was a scrappy little company. We started with Worthington propane tanks and some, and some Olympic rivets. Uh, and I think Trempro, um, Balcom back then. And, uh, we, uh, you know, it was a part-time gig for me and, and uh, it was a lot of fun. And we found that Airstreamers were willing to spend money. And uh, we, we were able to find um, through AOL dial-up service, quite a bit of um, support and saw this, this budding uh, community was, was willing to grow around us, which was really fun. Let's click the next. It wasn't until 2005 that we kind of got it in our heads that, that that wasn't really what we wanted to be. We wanted to be a, a company for everybody, um, for all vintage trailers. And so we changed our name and we became Vintage Trailer Supply. You can go ahead and click again. In 2016, we moved really from Vermont to New Mexico. Currently our, our center of focus is in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Several of you on this chat came, have visited us there, which is really cool. Um, I live in Vermont um, with my daughters but um, I, we do, I do travel monthly typically to Santa Fe and we have the majority of our staff in Santa Fe. Click again. Um, in 2019, in September, we held a grand opening. We bought an old TV station and we got rehabbed it into a beautiful distribution center, call center and showroom. In fall of 2019, we, uh, we limped across the finish line to be able to open a beautiful showroom in Santa Fe. And uh, we're very, very proud of that showroom. And then shortly after we opened it, click again, we hit the pandemic. So in March, we closed the showroom. Uh, we never really got it going all the way. We never got our big sign up out front and, uh, and uh, it has been closed ever since. Um, New Mexico has been um, up and down. I think there's been excellent leadership in New Mexico, but it's, it's a population that, um, has suffered a lot uh, with COVID and um, the, there, it has not really been a good opportunity for us to reopen safely and uh, to make it uh, the staffing work for us. So what's happened recently is we've put a lot, since 2016, we've put a lot of emphasis on moving into a physical location and building our, um, our physical presence. And um, we invested a lot in that. So where that left us was uh, moving into not really a, a bricks and mortar retail posture, but to have that as a big piece of what we did, we invested heavily in that. And um, 
it, at the same time, that meant that we were, I, I would say we were fragile and vulnerable going into the pandemic. So when the, when the pandemic hit, we simply, uh, we simply struggled hard. For the first six months of it, um, we were not able to keep up. We had staffing home, we had to lay off people um, and we, uh, we really were not able to fund the business in the way we would have liked to. This put a lot of the professionals in a bad situation where they weren't able to get the parts they needed when they needed them. We're digging out of that hole. We've done tremendously well in the second half of 2020, but we have a long way to go. So 2021 for us remains a rebuilding year. We're gonna see that uh, as we come through 2021, we're gonna be seeing uh, basically a return to normal operations. And we're very excited because before the pandemic hit in, in early 2019, we had invested heavily in new tooling, new engineering, and a whole host of new um, reproduction parts. And we have not been able to bring those to market yet, but they are queued up and ready to go. So we've got a lot of things that we're expecting by you know, late 21 and into 22, you're gonna see some really cool growth out of vintage trailer supply. Let's move on to the last, one of the last slides, I think. Go ahead and click one more time. Um, so we see basically three areas of concern for us. And I think for all of the, uh, anyone who's restoring a trailer going forward, first of all, is changing demand. You know, vintage trailer owners care a lot about the conservation of history and the conservation of their travel trailer uh, legacy. If you own a 50 whatever, you really care about that 50 whatever, and you wanna make sure that you do justice to it. When we see new people coming into the industry, and that's this has been true for the last five to 10 years, um, they're not necessarily as preservation minded. That's not to say they don't care to some extent, but in a lot of cases, what they're looking for is a usable, inexpensive travel trailer. Um, and even a $25,000 travel trailer is inexpensive compared to a new disposable <laughs> RV. And so what we're seeing is that people are willing to um, come into the vintage trailer world. They like the cool factor um, on the outside, but not necessarily that interested in preserving anything on the inside. We're not snobs. We don't care. You can do whatever you want with it. But for our company, our niche is to do reproductions, historically faithful things. And so in generally what we're seeing is that we're not necessarily postured to be um, a, a one-stop shop for people who are doing custom work. We're really going to continue to focus on on preservation and restoration and, um, and reproduction. So that's where you'll see our emphasis going forward. Um, let's go on to the next, click twice more. So the next thing that's really an issue for everyone is going to be inflation. We're gonna see 2021 is gonna be an inflationary year. We've already started seeing it in the second half of this year. Raw material prices for consumer goods have go has gone up a lot. Um, we're seeing um, steel and aluminum specifically prices have gone up uh, easily over 20%, in some cases 50 to 80% in raw material costs. And that's putting a huge pinch on uh, things like uh, aluminum propane tanks or even uh, steel wheels. Those sorts of things, those basics in the uh, travel trailer industry are really going to start costing a lot more. Um, We've already had to put in place some of those. And then transportation costs have gone crazy. Um, you all saw it around the holidays with the post office not being able to take care of what they needed to. Um, it was not constrained just to them or contained just to them. UPS and FedEx had issues. And one of the biggest pressures right now is international shipping, uh, bringing things in on boats and airplanes. It's gotten crazy. Um, and that is, and we're talking, um, you know, 20, 30, 40% increase in the cost of importing goods. Um, and on top of that, remember that uh, a couple of years ago, we started seeing, uh, and when I say we, I mean anyone who's, who's uh, selling consumer goods that are not made in the good old USA, is we're seeing, you know, about a 30% uh, tariffs on a lot of goods that came in. So what you're going to see in the next six months to a year is significant inflation in most consumer goods. Um, I think we've been really benefiting from competition and globalization in terms of keeping consumer goods too cheap for too long, you know, the plastic world. Um, and I think what we're seeing now is that that's kind of, at least for now, coming to an end. Things are gonna go up. Um, so unfortunately we have to do that too. And that's not great for us competing against giants like, you know, Amazon or whoever. Let's do two more clicks. 
And then the last thing, and this is what uh, those of you in the business would uh, probably curse vintage trailer supply on an almost weekly basis is unpredictability of supply. Um, Beginning in February, international supply chains went into chaos. Uh, we had a huge stop, then we had a start, we have a stop. There is absolutely no way to guarantee anything that's coming from anywhere right now. Um, even you know RV mainstream brands like Valterra um, or Thetford, or um, you know they they too are a disaster right now. So it's not just. Uh, specialty goods or small things. It's really the whole RV industry and the supply chain related to it um, are a mess. A good example, Worthington propane tanks, which many of you may own, the aluminum propane tanks, um, they, uh, they had to shut, their plants still shut down. And it's because they have too many people out with COVID right now. And, uh, and they were planning a, a warehouse or a factory move for years that um, they finally had to implement and they thought they might as well pull it off while they can't run their factory anyway. So we're seeing you just simply cannot even get some, some products. So it's just crazy right now. So um, the change of our customer base and who's in our vintage trailer world, the high cost and the difficult supply are part of what we're gonna see in 2021. That's it, click on to the next. So uh, let's start, I just have four takeaways. Yeah, go ahead and flip them up. Um, one is uh, we're going to have a crowded campground this year. 2021 is going to be less uh, remote and uh, socially distanced than we might wish in some ways. Um, a lot of people out there sharing our, our hobby. Secondly, um, prices are going to be strong for vintage trailers as well as new RVs. Um, if you're in a position to take advantage of that, great. If you need to buy a vintage trailer, you're not doing it the right year. But, you know, what the heck, join in. And third is, um, it's a little too early to feel normal. I think that a lot of our social distancing is gonna continue through 2021. I think that we're gonna have, the way we do rallies is different, the way we camp is different. Um, and finally, I think this is the big one for a lot of us is it is still stressful. And if we can love on each other and really take care of each other as we have in the last year, um, it's gonna be a much easier 2021 for everyone. So I think I'm gonna stop there. Um, and uh, turn it back over to questions or to Terry to, to finalize. Yeah, so I'll, while I'm switching over back to the other um, presentation, if you have a question specifically around Steve's information that he provided here, go ahead and uh, type it in the chat, or if you wanna come off mute and ask it uh, audibly, uh, feel free. Didn't see anything right now in the chat and I'll pull up the other slide here. The one thing that was, I felt was really impressive last year was exactly what kind of Steve started with um, was the fact that the community, the restorers, Steve's company, um, different clubs got together and, you know, held, held hands through the process. And I think, um, I think we were all thinking this was gonna go a lot differently than it did. Um, initially, I, just like Steve said, I think there was a big concern that this was really gonna shut um, restorers down, uh, shut our camping down. Um, and uh, it did to some extent, but then it kind of changed quite a bit with, you know, once, restrictions and lockdowns started lifting and opening up, um, recreational activities became something that people could do fairly safely, um, right? So it allowed them to get out of the house and go and do um, at least some camping, whether it was by themselves or with some friends. And it really kind of changed to where I think restorers started seeing uh, all of a sudden pent up demand. And I, I've heard this term, I think I heard it yesterday, people talking about having their COVID trailer, which is, all right, they own one vintage trailer, but they look for something to do uh, to keep them busy last year. So they went out, bought a project trailer, their COVID trailer, 
that they could work on, you know, go has has something to do when they went out in the shop, um, and that you know that kind of activity started driving uh, the restorers, uh, started driving the demand for uh, vintage trailer supply. I do have one question. Alice uh, asks, can you order online and pick up curbside uh, in Santa Fe, Steve? Yeah, and I also see Ryan's question there too. Um, this is, a, both are kind of related to uh, the showroom. Um, uh, Ryan's asking also, um, when, when are we gonna get that showroom back open basically? Um, so, uh, you know, I think that what we've done to adapt is we have, yes, you can pick up, um, we have a system where if you order from us and you're in the area, um, you can simply use our address as your ship to, and uh, you won't be build any shipping costs. And uh, what that does is it automates a, a set of communications within our company and back to you that tells you how to pick up. So we do require that you give us some notice um, because it's uh, it takes us a little while to mobilize. And we are really careful not to let our um, our warehouse fulfillment team make contact with people. Um, it's been, we've demanded that they stay working through this in order to keep our business afloat. And so uh, to be fair to them, we've also kept them very, very safe through this. So we don't let them have any contact with even our sales staff. Um, so uh, we need time when you do a, a buy online pickup in store. Um, but if you just, you know, use our address as, and you can call in or, you know, text us and ask us what the, how to do that, but use our address as your ship to if you're in the area and we're happy to prepare it and we have a place we can uh, leave your order for a no contact pickup very easily. Unfortunately, we can't consult with you on site. Our our calls, our uh, customer service folks aren't even there. So it's not possible to do a, um, to do kind of our normal hangout around the campfire talk. Um, when are we gonna reopen? We have not set a date. We have um, reduced our staffing for the year. Um, so our customer service staff, and it's going to shrink a little bit more. Um, we're going to um, be a little light in terms of our staffing for a while. So we're probably not going to open our showroom until midsummer. Um, we're, we're not sure. We have to do a little bit of a cost benefit analysis of it's, it's pretty intense for us to staff that space. And we need to be careful not to um, divert our precious limited resources to the wrong spots right now. We wanna really take good care of our online customers who are really, you know, 95% right now. Um, but it is a, um, it is a, it is something we wanna do. It's so important to us to have it open eventually. So I'm sorry, I can't give you a little better than that, but buy online, pick up in store, no problem. And, uh, and then uh, we'll open it up soon, we hope. We do have a little a note at the top of our website, upper right-hand corner, there's a little, little, banner that says showroom or something and you can just click on that to see the status at any time and then we have a really cool chat function on our site now you can just you don't need to email us or you just chat us really easily um <clears throat> i see that michael wants to know um what's up with our with our teardrop marker lights and maybe other marker lights um and that gets us into a uh a, this back into this same issue of um not being able to pull the trigger on projects we wanted to we have, um, we have underestimated the demand for the teardrop marker lights. <laughs> so we have ordered with very long lead times, two small batches. And um, we are going to learn someday not to do that, um, but it has been a problem. And the, um, the outlay each time we do that is massive when we reorder those. And so we're, um, and we've had, We've been trying to figure out a way to make it affordable so we don't have to raise the price on those things. And that's a little bit of an issue. Um, you know, we don't like to see spending, you know, $25 for a marker light. So we're trying to make sure, you know, we're still not doing the, the volume of a, you know, one of these major truck light companies. So it's not like we can just crank them out by the, you know, tens of thousands. Um, so uh, anyway, so we're working on it. We expect them back. Um, I'm gonna be careful because this is being recorded. Uh, I think we're going to be late May. That's my guess. All right. That's my guess. Uh, 
And uh, clearly those are imported from Asia. Uh, There's not a lot of folks making LED lights like that here. And uh, we have, um, uh, so we work directly with that small manufacturer there who we have had a partnership for a long time. And uh, it's a very high quality company that we work with. And obviously they're made absolutely to our engineering. So um, love it. We think they're great. We just need to learn not to run out of those things because that is the biggest thing right now that people are frustrated with us is that one product, mm -hmm. teardrop marker lights. Um, I also have a question about um, bargeman locks. Um, we have sold reconditioned locks in the past. Um, yes, we did. We, we liquidated a bunch of reconditioned locks for, for a locksmith who was restoring those. A guy by the name of Tom Bortner, really cool, cool guy who's a retired locksmith. Um, Tom has slowed way down. He doesn't get the, the quantity he has. We kind of went through his old stock and um, Tom is, uh, he gets us products. He gets us the locks if he can get them. But in the old days, he would drive around the country and find bargeman locks and he doesn't do that anymore. So it's a little different. It's kind of dried up. Um, we're working on reproduction parts for locks. Um, as you, some of you know, the, uh, like around 1960, there was a bargeman lock, the L77 uh, that we did the handle for in the last year. And that is a gorgeous uh, thing that's helped a lot of people. We have been promising to come out with the reproduction L66 for 10 years now, we haven't finished it. We're very close on that. That ended up being uh, more expensive than we had hoped. And um, both in terms of initial production run and, and tooling. Um, we have it engineered. We um, have done some soft prototyping on it. We love it. Uh, we think we can build it. Um, maybe in 2021, we're hoping that the full Bargeman L66, which is the horizontal lock that Bargeman made that is not used on Airstreams. Um, we think that that one is probably gonna, that's, that's gonna come out. Um, we're still working on uh, more reproduction parts for um, some of the others, the L100, L200 um, that y'all know about, which is the round lock, round knob, square back plate, or sometimes lever, square back plate. Um, that one is on our, on our production timeline, we'll do it. I'm not making any guesstimates on when that's gonna be done because we haven't been able to pull off the L66, which was our highest priority. So, uh, you know, we're squeezed in this situation where there's a lot of folks who want our stuff, who, you know, we have good demand, right? For what we need to do, but it's not, you know, it's not grease towing demand. Um, and so what we are, we just cannot just throw everything at it at once. The, the cost on, on tooling, when you build something, the you know the die casting and the injection molding and the all, it, it adds up. And so um, we have to amortize that cost over a lot of units, and we can't sell a lot of units in one year. And so it, we just have to be able to fund that investment each time. And that's that's probably one of the biggest things that's gotten us stuck in 2020. So uh, so we're in, we're on it. Um, we, uh, we are actually in a much stronger position today than we were a year ago. And uh, we've also done a ton of investment in our, our uh, software. Um, it's, we're, we're actually, uh, it, I'm pretty excited about where we're going and I'm just sorry you'll have to wait for us so long. All right, excellent. Thanks, Steve. Um, I had a slide here about, you know, how the pandemic has impacted the TCT. Since uh, we've got about 10 minutes left, I'll just spend five minutes talking through some of the key points here. Um, and then we'll get to the rest of the questions after that as they, as they roll in. Uh, so leadership transition during turmoil. Uh, so similar to Steve who opened a shop uh, right when the pandemic hit, uh, my parents retired and we transitioned into a new role almost at the exact same time. So here we were thinking we had a well-oiled machine that we didn't have to worry about. Uh, the only thing we had to worry about was making sure that we kept the lights on and we kept doing the things that made the club um, and the things that my parents did well to, to keep the club active and growing the club and then the pandemic hit. And instead of going and hosting um, a lot of rallies that we had planned for uh, in 2020, we really had to kind of change our mindset for 
how to, you know, um, uh, guide the club and guide hosts through uh, a very difficult time period, um, provide them the right guidance um, and support and provide our members with information of how this, uh, how we're going to get through this. So it really kind of, it really changed what we had to do. We had planned a lot of rallies and we had to unwind them uh, throughout the year and and as we learned about the pandemic, we had to change uh, direction lots of times. Uh, so it was a really strange way to start. Um, but on the other hand, it gave us a lot of opportunities to do some things differently too, right? So we wanted to um, do things not exactly in the same way that my parents had done things. And this kind of forced the issue to, and gave us some room to be able to to start planning for change. Um, the challenges of providing safety guidance with states in different climates. Um, so this is kind of true for how uh, the uh, whole US had to deal with uh, COVID differently as uh, the pandemic kind of was changing um, and being handled differently. Um, so we tried to provide initially broad guidance um, that all states, all hosts could use. Um, and we really wanted to side on caution initially and be cautious. Um, so we, uh, we met with our hosts, we met with our regional reps, we sat down with them. They helped us um, figure out uh, what the guidance should be um, so that you know, we were even early on, we were still um, thinking that we were gonna be able to do some things last year. Um, and uh, we wanted to have successful gatherings for the hosts and the attendees. And we, we, we tried to do that. Um, our goal was to supplement some of the CDC guidance um, and the state health guidance. We didn't wanna, you know, throw that out. We actually, wanted to have a layer on top of that, um, kind of unique to the camping experience. Um, and just to give you an example of kind of the differences between regions, you know, when COVID hit, um, Florida was kind of at the tail end of their camping season, uh, right? At the their tail end of the 2019, 2020 season. I see Dennis shaking his head. He was right there with us. Uh, Michigan was just starting in the in the Northeast and mid states was just starting to think about camping and what it was going to look like when COVID hit. And um, so we had to, you know, so for Florida, that initial uh, start of the pandemic didn't really impact them right away. It, it did change a few of the events, some of the things uh, that were late in their season were shut down. But for Michigan, it, like Steve was saying, it, it virtually wiped out all of our events. And now uh, coming into, you know, this winter, uh, the Florida became, okay, how do we work our way through the pandemic and work our way through maybe having some gatherings? So it was, it was quite different. Um, the evolution of safety protocols and keeping up with best practices. I looked at our guidelines for hosting rallies and attending rallies. You can look at, uh, if you go to the Tin Can Tourist website, you click on news, you can see our latest guidance. We're at version four. So I think just like everyone has kind of had to learn about the science and learn about things and uh, make adjustments, we've done the same thing and now we're on uh, version four. So we started very broadly you know, our guidance included how you deal with surfaces and clean surfaces at rallies. Um, and then we found out that the surfaces wasn't the primary way a lot of the stuff was being transmitted. We, we were thinking we could go ahead and have food options like potlucks and things like that. And we were providing guidance for how to do that as safely as possible. Um, then our guidance did kind of change like Steve mentioned early on to open houses, um, you know, clustering people, bringing people into your trailers, um, having festivals. Uh, our club gets invited to a lot of festivals and those are just large open houses. And we kind of 
uh, we fell back to where let's just stop with open houses for now. That seems to be a very bad thing. It's hard to socially distance in an open house. You're gonna be inviting uh, people into your trailers because that's typically what an open house is about. Um, and then our guidance around gathering started to look for ways that we could still have a gathering and a rally, but reduce the activities that would cluster people, that would obviously cluster people. We didn't wanna promote anything like that. And now with this, uh, with the vaccines coming on, and unfortunately the variants of COVID uh, kind of popping up, we're, we're hopeful that we're gonna get back to doing some things uh, in 2021, but then we're also cautious about how we're heading. Um, one of the last things that we adjusted in our guidance was around contact tracing. We didn't have anything around there uh, early on. We didn't know that was gonna be important, but you know, if you have people come to a rally, uh, people come to an open house and all of a sudden you find out uh, a few days later, somebody went home, all of a sudden they're sick, you need to make sure you have the ability to go back and let people know uh, that they're, they might have been in contact and um, make sure that you can get that information back out to people. Um, financial difficulties of large events. So large events were extremely challenging. Uh, we saw this in Florida with the winter gathering. We saw this in Michigan with the Camp Dearborn gatherings. And the reason why is these large events have a lot of variable costs, right? So um, you have a lot of vendors uh, and a lot of costs that are based on how many people are gonna show up. And what we found throughout 2020 camping year was people were very cautious about registering for events. So they waited as long as possible to see, you know, how the state or the local um, levels of the pandemic were before they made any decisions. And also we saw huge amounts of um, people going ahead and backing out um, and canceling at the last minute. And for large events, that's impossible, right? So you have to have a, a good well-defined number up front so that you can get the suppliers and the vendors lined up, the size of the tents you're gonna need, the, uh, your catering, that kind of thing, entertainment, all that kind of stuff. And you can't have 30% of the people uh, back out at the last minute. It's just impossible. So large events are gonna be a struggle. Um, loyal members hung with us. Um, and what we saw is they continued throughout 2020 to leverage their TCT friendships, right? I think the main thing about a club is meeting people and creating bonds and creating friendships that are long lasting and uh, go beyond just uh, vintage trailer rallies. And so people leverage those friendships to have Zoom meetings. I just had one last night with, you know, another 10, 15 TCT members to just hang out and talk about how things are going. And we saw small, informal small gatherings of, you know, five close friends that would go and camp uh, together, socially distance, get the experience, not a large venue, but get, you know, kind of keep the experience going in 2020. Um, the change in the usage of trailers and enjoying nature, Steve covered a, a lot of that, but we, we saw the same thing that Steve talked about. Campgrounds were just packed um, last year and are going to be even more packed this year based on the growth and people coming into the hobby. And we're definitely seeing uh, 2021 is a movement to smaller gatherings with limited agendas. So a lot of what we're focusing on in, in 2021 is what we're calling show up and camp events, which is we'll schedule, um, we'll schedule a campground and work with a campground to hold sites for us. People can register uh, together. It's a, you know, a weekend to be together, but not necessarily be that close together where we're going to pile people in, have a potluck, uh, but get people in the same campground, allows them to interact, stay socially distanced, kind of get back to a little bit of normalcy, uh, kind of ease our way back into camping. 
Um, and then I looked at this time and I think Steve, I heard the same thing is this was a time to invest. This was an opportunity um, if, you, if you would take it. Uh, so we invested in a lot of upgrades as well. Upgrades to our software, upgrades to our website, upgrades to our infrastructure, doing it now um, so that when we get back to doing uh, back to somewhat normal, uh, we'll be ready for it. And the other thing is I've put, you know, get back to roots. Um, a lot of what, so the TCT has been around for 20 plus years, just like vintage trailer supply. And a lot of um, that growth has, in some cases, made events really big and really complicated. Sometimes it's good to kind of go back to the simplicity and, uh, and you know, smaller events and more intimate events and less complicated things. And uh, there's a lot of joy in that. And I think uh, we're gonna come out of this, we're gonna be forced into going back to our roots to some extent. But we were actually, before the pandemic, we were talking about our desire, Michelle and myself, of kind of getting back to the smaller types of venues and getting back to us, you know, kind of simpler rallies. And this will, this is going to allow us to do that. All right. So we are right at four o'clock. We can keep going a little bit, at, answer a few more questions. Alice did have a question. Uh, any update on reintroducing entry door hinges? So not only do you need the handle, but you need the hinges for our airstreams. So Steve, that's for you. You're on mute too. I'm, I'm trying to find the message. Um, what she was sent the question direct to me. Uh, yeah, she sent it direct to me. It's any update on reintroducing entry door hinges for 47 to 50 Airstream liners. So very specific. Uh, yeah, they actually, the same hinges, there may be some, some I mean, there's obviously mild steel and, and stainless, but there's, there's a pretty consistent, I don't, I don't know if the 47 to 50 liners are different than the, um, and there's a lot of restorers here could tell us, than the, uh, the ones going up to 62. Um, but uh, we did make a really nice hinge for a while. Classic case where we spent a lot of time on, uh, on uh, getting those just right. And we had it all, we were having them made and then we went, it took us years to get through a hundred sets, years. And then uh, we sold out of our last one and we went back to the person who made them for us and they had disappeared. And it took so much work to get it going again that we didn't do the model ourselves. Our supplier did the model. So we have to start over if we're gonna do it. I did save a few sets. I do have some, I know what I wanna do with them but I haven't, I haven't put the investment into it yet. So no. I'm not gonna do hinges in 2021. So if anybody else out there wants to get on it and get those hinges made, please do, <laughs> so that I don't have to have to disappoint folks. Cause that's kind of where we're at at this point is I really encourage folks to get out there and make parts because we, we cannot take care of what we've already committed to do. Um, so anyone who wants to do it, do it. And if, uh, you know, let us know. But there, there's some demand. There's not, honestly, there's not a ton of demand. If you sell, you know, a hinge set a month or something, you know, you're doing okay on those. And that's not really enough to support the investment. Any other questions? Steve, I you kind of, what kind of popped in my mind when you were talking about this. Do you see um, people using 3D printers a lot for doing uh, parts? I kind of see that every now and then in our, in our forums. Yeah. Um, before I answer that, uh, Gene just suggested to remind people that still a good source for parts is to find, you know, salvage trailers that have, that are picked over already and just continue that process. Um, it's, you know, we hate to see any of them go away, but some of them are gone. And so you might sure. as well. Um, uh, 3D printing. I actually, five years ago, I predicted it was going to come on a lot faster for uh, hard to get parts. It really hasn't. Um, I think that we're seeing it there are some folks who are into it um, and uh, they have, uh, especially we see it for things like, uh, you know, like toilet parts, like a, a part that's like a plastic part or something yeah. that might be um, not get that heavy wear and tear. You know, there's a lot coming on with, you know, aluminum, carbon fiber. There's a lot of things you can 
three D print now. So right. you know, it's going to continue to to replace um, uh, some of the hard tooling out there. But um, there's there's a you know, this is a business question for us always, which is where is there enough demand to warrant the investment in the tool? And yeah. it's a it's endless judgment call for us. You know, we somebody on my team will say, hey, I just got my third call this month on somebody needing X. Are you going to make that finally? And I'll be like, you know, I just don't think it's there, right? So a, a marker light, you need four to 10 on a trailer, right? So I, you know, the same, it's the same tool takes care of quite a bit of sales there. And it's, but some things you make one and that's just the, you're going to sell one per trailer and only to every 10th trailer or one hundredth trailer. So we, we are really careful the way we've been able to bootstrap this for 20 years is to just be a little bit behind the demand. You know, we really are trying to be smart about the way we spend our money. And honestly, 2019, late 2019 and 20, early 2020, that model fell apart. And so we are getting back on that. And I'm going to be very careful about what I commit to. Okay. Um, Rebecca uh, was, she sent me a direct message about 3D print. And, and this is part of the reason I brought that up is, you know, she, I know she and her husband do uh, 3D printing. And so, you know, people need a, a logo, right, that uh, came on their trailer and it's broken in half. And I see a lot of people in our community offering up their 3D printing services to say, hey, I can replicate that for you. That's great. Uh, yep. Uh, and great. other parts as well. Uh, Dennis. Wonderful. Uh, Dennis down in Florida, in sunny Florida, he had to rub that in. Um, he's, he said, uh, do you have a source for the Bargeman L400 lock? That's uh, what came on his 75 Avion. Yeah, and it came on, yeah, it's an Avion and it's on some other trailers, including a lot of the fiberglass trailers. Um, it's, um, <laughs> there's Jean doing a little advertisement for <laughs> that she just happens to have one sitting there. Um, we're not doing 400s right now. 400s is actually not a very hard lock for us to do. Um, we may pull it out uh, later, but it's not something we're doing right now. Um, my tick list is um, L66. Um, working on K KT just because Airstream is a disaster. Yeah, I know, Greg. Airstream's a disaster on that. KT is a super easy lock for us to do. Um, then we're looking at doing the, um, probably the L100, L200. Um, so we've got, those are probably our tops. We're doing a lot of parts for keelers. We're doing parts for the H20, the uh, L5455s. L400, L we will do more parts for. Um, so, uh, but I don't know if we'll do the full L400 for a couple of years. Um, eventually I wanna do all that bargeman locks. Okay, yeah, I, I was gonna say, it seems like uh, the, door handles and the locks are what everyone's looking for. Jim asked about entry grab handles for early Shastas. Yeah, we, we just did a, um, we just finished and it's on our site now, the lens for all of the lit up bargeman handles. Um, you know, the, the, it hangs down under the handle. Those handles are illuminated, but the lenses were made out of glass and they filled up with water and cracked and broke. Um, so we now have a plastic lens that's awesome for those with the little tiny little stainless steel clips that holds that thing into the slot. So if anybody has one of the grab handles that has a light in it that shines down, the lights that shine down, not the ones where it's all illuminated, the ones that shine down, we finally have a way to restore those handles really cool. Um, so that's there. Um, but the grab handle itself, um, we used to, when, when Airstream did its uh, repop on the 61 air flights, um, we bought out a lot of their extra parts from that and they had a grab handle. They had the grab handle for that, um, for the 61s that they reproduced. They didn't do a perfect job reproducing it. Um, we were gonna buy their tool and we decided not to. So we'll probably redo the grab handles later, but we're, it's not on our immediate list. Um, Brian, I um, can't remember his name, Brian's Vintage Trailers out West. He did them for a while out of a beautiful investment cast stainless but he quit and he said it wasn't really possible anymore. So right now there's no one making those. All right. So I think unless you have questions coming directly to you, that about uh, no. is all the questions. 